Good morning, everyone. I am Peter Carmichael, the director of the Civil War Institute here at Gettysburg College, also a member of the history department, and I am accompanied this morning by colleague, Dr. Jill Titus. Uh, she is also at the Civil War Institute, and we're really looking forward to having a few minutes with you this morning to tell you a little bit about the battle here at Gettysburg, but to also have a discussion about why certain stories are told here and other stories seem to fade over time. And one reason these stories fade over time is the landscape itself. And so for many of you, I've heard, I've never been to the battlefield before. And in fact, you have been. Every morning you wake up, you walk out of your dorm and you go to class, the fighting occurred right there in the center of Gettysburg College. And so for us to get situated or oriented with the college, I want you to look off to your left front here Look at those beautiful fields in front of you. And you can see those fields stretching all the way to where the lacrosse field is or the soccer field. You can see the, the glass structure that of course is the fitness center. And back in 1863, you wouldn't have seen any of that, but what you would have seen is the edifice. That's what they called it back in the day. That's Penn Hall, right? That was the locus of all academic activities. And that Penn Hall would have been a beacon, a beacon for the soldiers on July 1st, Union and Confederate. But once again, I want you just to look off into these fields. And again, they're so beautiful. This pastoral setting, you have to think, my God, a fighting could not have occurred here. 45,000 casualties in three days could not have occurred here. And it is this beautiful setting that is before us that is the great challenge in trying to understand and make meaning of this horrible carnage that occurred. Now, I gotta give you a little bit of history, and then I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Now, a little bit of history is simply this. In July of 1863, a Confederate army under Robert E. Lee decided to raid the North. He wanted to give Virginia a break from the war, but above all else, what he hoped to achieve was a dramatic and decisive victory on Northern soil. That victory, he believed, would bring dissension to the northern people. The northern people were not united behind this conflict. Do we have any New Yorkers in here by chance? Oh, there we have one. Do you know what happened after Gettysburg in July of 1863 in New York City? Yeah, well, you know what, guess what? I've had three classes and I've asked New Yorkers across the board and they don't know. What happened was the great draft riots in New York City, in Manhattan, terrific destruction. Those draft riots organized by Irish immigrants, Irish immigrants who believe that the war was placing an unfair burden on them because they were being conscripted and drafted into the army. They took to the streets. They destroyed the homes of rich people. They targeted the draft office and they burned to the ground a black orphanage and lynched a few African-American men. It's important again for us to appreciate this context because then we can appreciate why this great bloodletting, this tremendous loss of life, that there were political stakes here and they were extraordinarily high in July of 1863. Now I want you to be able to visualize the fighting that occurred. That first day fighting, it happened right here where we're standing, this is called Oak Hill. Look off to your left front again and turn a little bit more to your left. We have a tree line directly in front of us. Look beyond that and you can see another tree line and a road, and of course, eventually you'll have some cars that'll be going back and forth. And then if you look, you'll see a little bald hill and a road leading off to it. You're all pointed in the exact direction you need to be. You'll also see a little monument. That is called Barlow's Knoll today. It is out on that high ground that Union forces occupied, if you look at me now, would be the far Union right flank on the fighting of July 1st. That Union line continued to your front. Look down into that low ground again, that beautiful pastoral setting. If you look very closely, you'll see a series of monuments. Those are all Union monuments. Those monuments follow the battle line roughly of July the 1st. That battle line would continue. Now look directly straight ahead. As you look across what is the Mummersburg Road, you'll see again another row of monuments. Those are Union monuments following the battle line. That battle line would continue to our south. So it is from here 
from this remarkable uh, position in which you can take in most of the field on July the 1st. I'm not going to bog you down with any of the details at all. I will simply say this. The fighting or the battle that occurred here on July the 1st is not a battle that Robert E. Lee wanted. He came to Gettysburg, not for shoes, as some people say, but instead he came here because he thought he could concentrate his army. He got the battle that he did not want. It was a battle that ultimately resulted on July the 1st for a decisive Union victory. And so again, I want you to look back across these fields, and I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine after a long day of continuous fighting that this Union line directly in front of us, about almost a half a mile away, that that Union line was outnumbered, and those Union forces all the way over at that knoll, Barlow's Knoll, that they were ultimately, they were outflanked, and the entire Union line here wavered, broke, and gave way. And so late that day, Union soldiers were fleeing across our campus, again, not called, it's called Pennsylvania College, not Gettysburg College back in the day. They fled across that campus, ran through the streets of Gettysburg, and then took a high position just on the outskirts of town. This great victory for Robert E. Lee on July the 1st, the Union forces that were part of this retreat were German soldiers, German immigrants. These were men, and it is an important story to be told because it is one of those stories that has faded largely from public awareness. These German soldiers were the political refugees of the revolutions of 1848. These revolutions, they were revolutions of political liberalism. Many of these men who came here and left Germany or Prussia, who came here, were very idealistic. They believed not just in the cause of Union, but they were some of the few Union soldiers who believed in emancipation. They were against slavery. And these men, ironically enough, were despised by their fellow white soldiers. Low, for a number of reasons, the first being the most obvious. They spoke a strange dialect. They had strange cultural habits. And there was, as you all are aware of, a long history in the United States of fear of immigrants, fear of the other. Here's a classic example of that. But again, what is so disturbing, concerning, is that these men, they had volunteered. They're giving themselves to the union cause. And it's those men, if you look back off to the left again, you need to imagine anchoring that far Union right flank. And unfortunately, their commanding officer did not take proper care or preparations to defend the flank or the end of their line. When the Confederates attacked, of course, they could not defend themselves because they were hit on the side. It is these German soldiers that then had to flee across this open ground. And when they fled across this open ground, it affirmed in the minds of many other Union soldiers that German Americans could not be trusted in the ranks, that German Americans by nature were cowardly. Now for those Union soldiers and the rest of the fighting force on July the 1st, they make their way through town and the end they occupy that high ground and we know the outcome of the battle. The next two days, the Confederates continue to try to attack and to try to drive the Union army off their high ground and they fail. 45,000 casualties in three days, three days. Again, take a look at all of this. When people come here today, it is easy for them to imagine the heroism and the bravery of these Union soldiers and the Confederate as well. But what we forget in those 45,000 casualties is the grim reality of these individual losses. These men who, of course, on both sides had families, families often that never ever saw those bodies again because they were never able to get or ship those corpses home. And so I wanted to show you one photograph, a photograph that was probably taken near here, a photograph that is taken of Union soldiers, a photograph that again will help you visualize what that loss, that horrible loss, what it might have looked like. And as we can see, and I'll show you again in just a moment so you can get a closer look, many of these men, they're without shoes. Many of these men have their pockets pulled out 
Why? You know why? Why are their shoes off? Why are their pockets pulled out? So other soldiers came in, Confederate soldiers in this case, and they came in and they stripped the bodies. They stripped the bodies of their personal belongings, took their shoes. Now again, imagine for these men on both sides who went off to war thinking that this would be a romantic adventure or believing that there was a high cause in which a man would give his life and that life would be part of a sacred and meaningful death. This is not the death that Civil War soldiers imagined. But it demanded on both sides that you had to make meaning of this death. And for the most part, the people who come and visit Gettysburg today, they're so caught up in the heroism of the fighting that they often don't have a moment to reflect upon how the meaning of this death has changed over time. Because for most people, they think of the great heroism on both sides, and that started early on after the war. The veterans, they came back here, northern and southern, and surprisingly, they came back as citizens of the same country. People who reached across the famous stone wall and shook hands and said that they respected each other as American fighters. And so the thing for you to think about is that this war brought about great revolutionary change. Brought about the end of slavery. It brought the union of this nation. But in doing so, stories of the German Americans were not told. And the story of the coming of the war, the fight over slavery, and ultimately emancipation, all of that started to recede. And so we're going to take our next stop over to the monument that's off to your right, a monument that's called the Eternal Peace Light. It is a monument that speaks to Northern and Southern soldiers as Americans, not as adversaries, not as men engaged in a bloody and brutal and vengeful civil war. And it should in fact strike you how amazing it is that this killing ground could ultimately become a healing ground. And so Professor Titus will talk to us about that and we will have to contemplate and think about that there's something good in reaffirming about reconciliation. None of us, I think, can challenge or question that. But it came at a price. And that price was the story of those German Americans, those immigrants who fought here at Gettysburg, who were dismissed and damned by their comrades. The very men who were the most idealistic here, that story, it recedes. And then the story of the enslaved people themselves and the outcome of this war in bringing emancipation. When you were looking at the monument, did you see anything that would indicate when it was placed here? Not really, no. So Pete talked about the veterans reunions up on the hill. This idea came out of the 1913 veterans reunion, the 50th anniversary of the battle. It was a huge occasion. There was a massive tent city over near the Emmitsburg Road, about 42,000 veterans came back and four days of speeches and addresses and all kinds of events. President Woodrow Wilson was here. Keep in mind, Wilson's the first Southerner elected to the White House since the Civil War. He gave a speech over in that great tent that I want to read you one sentence of it because it really encapsulates ideas about reconciliation in the late 19th, early 20th century. So Wilson says, we have found one another again as brother and comrade in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends, rather our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except that we shall not forget the splendid valor, the manly devotion of the men then arrayed against one another, now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes literally in those images of veterans shaking hands across the fence at the angle. The idea for this monument comes out of that reunion, which is called the Peace Jubilee. Now, as Pete alluded to earlier, who's going to argue with that sentiment? Peace eternal in a nation united, everybody in the world essentially could, could get on board with that sentiment. But can you think of 
any potential negatives of this idea of reunion, this idea of reconciliation, or what parts of the Civil War might we not remember so clearly when this is the main narrative, this idea of reconciliation. The fact that this is a war for emancipation and liberation that brought about emancipation for four million enslaved people who then went on to not really experience a full emancipation because segregation, discrimination set in immediately. The meaning of freedom was always incomplete. And that story is not a part of the story of reconciliation because it shows the way that the, per the, 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 the purpose of the war, the meaning of the war has been betrayed. What else, what other parts of the Civil War might be obscured by this focus on peace eternal? Yeah, go ahead. Women's roles. Good, good, which are, which are extensive. You sort of have this allegorical female figure, but it doesn't really tell us anything about the experiences of real live women during the war. It also, it suggests that when 1865 came, the war ended, that that meant the nation was at peace. It didn't. There's no easy transition from war to peace. This monument, that idea of Wilson's, of you know, we focus on the splendid valor, that ignores and, and marginalizes the continued suffering of those who fought here, the psychological suffering, the physical suffering that extended to the end of their lives for, for many of those men. That's obscured in this. We also, with this reconciliationist lens, we don't see the extent to which many Americans at the time, including many veterans, never bought into this idea. This idea was not universally accepted. In the 1913 gathering alone, first of all, there were Confederate troops, Confederate units that refused to come because they said, to participate in this would suggest that our cause was wrong, and we're, that's not a stand that we are willing to take. There were conflicts in the tent camp over the flying of the Confederate flag outside of the headquarters of some of the, the Confederate regiments. Many Union veterans, black and white, were very offended by that. They pushed back against it. Seven men got stabbed in the dining room of the Hotel Gettysburg during the 1913 reunion. Somebody made a disparaging comment about Abraham Lincoln, and a fight broke out in the hotel dining room. There are, there are accounts of the women rushed to the windows to, to leap to, to safety if necessary. Seven people get taken to the hospital with stab wounds. <clears throat> and even those, those images of veterans reaching across the fence. It happened, yes, but it didn't happen organically. That pose was suggested by photographers who were present that day looking for good copy. So all of that gets obscured in this vision of reconciliation. It takes a long time to raise the money for this. It doesn't get actually dedicated until 1938. And Pete has a picture of the dedication ceremony, which was huge, drew about 200,000 people. President Franklin Roosevelt gave the dedication address standing somewhere over there. And the narrative of white reconciliation is still very strong in 1938. The narrative of peace eternal is certainly very strong for Americans who are watching developments in Europe and the Pacific unfold and are extremely worried about the nation being drawn into another global war. So Roosevelt talks in his in his address a lot about the, what is the phrase exactly? The people's good, I think. Yes, the, about retaining a people's government for the people's good, which of course would, would resonate very strongly for people who are concerned about the rise of fascism. Also, in a sense, it's the New Deal in a nutshell, the, the, a people's government for the people's good. But again, what gets lost when we look at this monument, nobody would think that some of the laborers who laid the foundation, who connected the gas line, 
were African American. Men who were here in Gettysburg as part of a New Deal program, Civilian Conservation Corps, did all kinds of work across the battlefield, building, building roads, building trails, recreation facilities, all across the country. When they were placed at Gettysburg, the local congressman complained. He asked that they be removed and white troops be sent in their place. <clears throat> when the question of black officers in these camps was raised, National Park Service officials said, we'll have a race riot in Gettysburg if you put black men in authority here. Roosevelt stood here and talked about the people's good. He talked about New Deal programs. Any African-Americans in this audience or any listening to that speech on the radio or seeing it in the newspapers undoubtedly would have thought first about why are we never included in the people's good? Why did we have to fight so hard to be included in any of these New Deal relief programs? Why are our narratives of the Civil War, our narratives of heroism and service, why didn't they win us full citizenship in this country? Why are we always tangential to the people's good? I think you know, one of the things that I think is compelling about this place is how people continue to use this spot, use this place, to make meaning of the war in very different ways. And so in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we've now seen this surge uh, of interest uh, over the future, the place of Confederate monuments. And as Jill mentioned before, that these debates about either Confederate monuments or Confederate flags is not something new at all. I mean, this place, and get turn around and look at this beautiful pastoral ground, take it in. It is not a battlefield. It's a commemorative landscape. Now, a commemorative landscape isn't something that gets people real excited. Hey, let's go to Gettysburg and see the commemorative landscape. It's no, right? Let's go see the battlefield. But what's lost when we don't think of this as a commemorative landscape is that we miss exactly what Jill has said. The people come here with their own political agendas. In the 1920s, there was a resurgence of the Klan. It is not the Klan that emerged after the war. That was the Klan that was a paramilitary organization, a terrorist organization, restricted almost entirely to the South. But in the 1920s, they come back. They come back strong. They come back in the North as well as the South. They have new targets, not just African Americans. It's Catholics. They're anti-immigration. And the Pennsylvania chapter, the Pennsylvania chapter, is it 1920? 1925. 1925, came right here. And in fact, they were standing just behind you, behind the parking lot, across the Mummersburg Road, in that open field. And I would say there wasn't a lot of controversy about their arrival. The people at Gettysburg welcomed them. The businessmen welcomed them. And so when we come here today, and I don't know what Americans think when they see the eternal peace light, I don't know if that connects with them. But I do know that what Professor Titus has said is true, that you can come here and not think about, not engage these controversial and important issues of race. But I ask you this, if you were to put a marker right here with a picture of the Klan, right here, and people would see it, they would look at it. And I suspect the National Park Service would get a lot of letters. Letters of some people would be confused. They would say, Robert E. Lee had the Klan with him? But others would say, to bring a picture of the Klan here is to take this sacred space and it is to demean it, to lose sight that this was a battlefield. And so you can now see the tension here, that the stories that Jill mentioned that were not told in the 1930s, the stories here in the 1920s, the stories in 1960, when the centennial was here, and George Wallace, George Wallace from Alabama was up there on that stage. George Wallace listened to a benediction from an African-American minister, a woman, probably the only black person, the only woman who was up on that yes. stage. She is up there speaking about the unity of races. She is saying that in front of George Wallace, 
George Wallace, as you know, who said what? Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That story, it's not here. It's not here. And so, we face a fascinating and interesting time and a time with opportunity. A time in which, as Jill has, I think, so carefully and powerfully explained to us, these narratives that happened after 1863, those narratives need to be what? They need to be in waysides, right? We need a picture of this, of the Klan here in the 1920s, so people can, can think about it. So we'll end with this. Can I say a few more oh, things? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> please. So behind that picture, Pete has a copy of the front page of the Gettysburg Times, a local newspaper from that week. You'll see on the top, it says special KKK edition. The town rolled out the red carpet for the Ku Klux Klan, literally. And, when the, and the Klan's reason for coming here, they made Gettysburg a central point of their strategy in the 1920s, trying to connect the blood and death and service of the men who died on this field to their narrative of what it meant to be an American. Actually, they tried to connect their own violent brawls with anti-Klan groups to the combat of, of Civil War soldiers. And what Pete was saying earlier about the 11th Corps is a great reminder of the extent to which the historical connection they were trying to make was deeply, deeply flawed from the very beginning. You can see the lines of the 11th Corps from here. The Klan in the 1920s, enormously anti-immigrant, enormously anti-Catholic. Many of those soldiers that they're trying to connect to were in fact people who they would not have embraced. The town's African-American community, Jewish community, Catholic community, their sentiments are not reflected in, this, in the Gettysburg Times welcome. But interestingly, some students at Gettysburg College spoke out. They wrote a piece in the, in the student newspaper calling the Klan un-American and un-Christian. And it's very interesting because you've probably talked about immigration reform in this country in the 1920s. This is a period where there is a, there is a very clear, specific attempt to keep the US population as white and as Northern European as possible. Many, many people did not see the Klan's behavior as anti-American. The Gettysburg College students did. Um, but the, there was one final point I wanted to make, and what was it? I'll, I'll, I'll connect to that. The outcry against the German Americans in the Union Army was so great after the Battle of Gettysburg because they had retreated that they, in fact, were transferred to an army in the Western Theater. And so here, these men who had given themselves physically, who had died on this field, the survivors of that, the wounded, none of that mattered to the comrades in the Army of the Potomac. They dismissed their service, and in fact, again, the anger toward them was so great, they were moved to, uh, to the Western Theater. Before we go real quickly, I'm just curious. People come to me all the time and they say, the younger generation has a challenging time in connecting to Civil War history. And so I'm curious, maybe you don't, maybe you do, but how does this place, how does it speak to you? How does it not speak to you? Um, I'm just curious, your thoughts. <laughs> you said, yeah, speak freely, it's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just feel like um, there's a lot of like painful memories attached to here. While it may speak about peace and stuff, which I understand, there's also a lot of pain, and I think it's just easier to forget that sometimes. But it's also really important, so I'm, I'm glad that we like talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Just on our own campus, we forget that Penn Hall was overflowing with wounded, the suffering, uh, physical, emotional suffering that took place right there. How how easy it is for us to push it push it aside. Any other things that begin why this place speaks to you or why you struggle to connect with it? Yeah. Why I struggle to connect with the Civil War is just because it's so very. I don't know what's the correct term, but I hear about the white soldiers and everything. But I also want to hear about, you know, the the black strong men and women who were fighting for the union. I want to hear about the emancipation and like how even to this day it's still there's still the segregation going on 
So I feel like that's one of the main reasons why I don't really connect with this. Well, I think you raise a very good point, and it is a challenge at all historical sites. When people can't see themselves in that historical past, it can be a challenge. And of course, people come here all the time, and they say, well, this was a struggle between white folks, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but there were lots of enslaved, thousands of enslaved people that were with the Confederate Army here. And it is a story, again, that doesn't come to the surface. Lee's army, when it came into Pennsylvania, it was an army that was an army of slave catchers. If you were an African-American in central Pennsylvania, you better get out of Dodge because this army treated many of those African-Americans not as free blacks, but as runaway slaves. And we don't really know the numbers, but certainly at least a few hundred, if not more, were captured in Pennsylvania and they were taken down to Richmond and sold in the slave market. But you can see the challenge though of telling that story because that story didn't take place right here. And so the thing about a historical site is that the place matters. And so I think that you make an excellent observation and it speaks to the great challenge of being able to bring in those diverse experiences when those people didn't actually occupy this historical ground. That's good. You look at our electoral maps, you can see that in the you know, east of the Mississippi, the, the political differences map on to the Union and the Confederacy, and it always makes me think that we're still engaged in the, these issues, that the issues that were thought about here really haven't gone away, and we really, for all the show of reconciliation, we still disagree deeply about a lot of these issues. You're going to... Yeah, no, you got... I would say yes, on the surface, it would appear that in fact that those political battle lines that existed during the Civil War, that they have largely remained intact. That's what it appears like. But I would strongly, strongly argue that in fact that that would be misleading. To see the conservatism that is associated with the South today as somehow a legacy of what happened with the Confederate cause, this Confederate nation, though devoted to the white supremacy, but above all else, it was devoted to the preservation of the institution of slavery. That institution was crushed and destroyed by that war. It is true that out of that, that white Southerners created new forms of dependence for African Americans, not just in terms of labor relations, but also making them second class citizens. But that's a very different story that then takes place. And we should remind ourselves that the states of what? Michigan, Wisconsin, as well as Ohio and Indiana, they've all going conservative and they're all voting for Donald Trump. Again, I'm not trying to make a political decision, decision or statement about how they vote. I'm just saying here that the conservatism that we see today and when we look at the electoral map today, it is tempting to say, oh, this is a straight connection or consequence of the ending of the Civil War. Um, yeah. It, it, it is, and I say to people all the time, you know, if you want to understand, uh, folks said to me, well, how do I understand conservatism in terms of Trump supporters? And I said, well, to begin with, don't make them homogenous. A man who voted for Donald Trump in the state of Michigan is probably different than a white man in Alabama who voted for it. So, you know, what history, I think, always tells us is to focus and to seek complexity. And you do that by being very careful about time and place. And the greater awareness of time and place will allow us to reach a deeper understanding of motivations, not just in the past, but in the present. Motivations of people that we don't think, God, I can't understand this at all. But that's one of the great joys of history is that it opens up, it cracks open that possibility to step in the shoes of someone else and to do that in the past and to imagine the world as they imagined it. That, of course, uh, then helps us appreciate why they did things again that seem unthinable to us, right? John, if you want to add about the... the yeah, the, no, the only thing I think I would add to that is in the 1960s, during the, the 100th anniversary of the battle, there, were, there was this really interesting sort of rhetorical conversation about the extent to which the Union Army was an army of liberation and the extent to which the North itself in the 1960s was a beacon of liberalism and a, a, you know, a haven for freedom. There were a number of Northern politicians who talked a lot about the blood our men shed on these grounds and that, that this motivates us today and this is who we are today. And they completely 
whitewashed the racial tensions and struggles and inequalities of their own states, their own regions, by associating racism specifically with the South. The governor of Pennsylvania, David Lawrence, he gave a speech at the National Cemetery where he talked about, you know, in Pennsylvania, there is no segregation in education. In Pennsylvania, there is no police brutality. In Pennsylvania, there is no this, 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 and this. And you can imagine that there were quite a few people in that audience going, what? Right, right. And then David Lawrence gets appointed to head the um, President's Commission on Fair Housing by John F. Kennedy, and he does absolutely nothing in the position, which is interesting. But that there were others, though, in that, in that decade, in that commemoration, who said, we might have comforting narratives about associating ourself as a region with the cause of emancipation and saying that's who we were then and that's who we still are today. But really, Racism is American, discrimination is American, and until we stop regionalizing it, we're not gonna get anywhere. I'll just end with this point for you all to think about. We have seen the fall of Confederate monuments in public spaces across the South and other memorials and plots uh, in other places, even of the North, that have acknowledged the Confederate experience. And I want you all again to think about, because it connects to what Jill said, is that I'm not rendering again judgment, either it should happen or should not happen, but I'll have you contemplate whether the removal of those monuments, how has it addressed and significantly changed social inequality in this country? Or does the removal of those monuments, does it for some people feel like, um, almost like a moral cleansing, right? We get up there, we tear those monuments down and we feel like we're doing something. So we need to ask ourselves that again, in this fascinating moment that we have in our history, that you all are right in the center of, what more can be done? Is that taking down of those monuments? Is it kind of a feel good moment that we are striking back at the past? And is it really enabling us to look forward and take some real tangible steps? And I don't have any easy answers for that, but it certainly demands, I think, a lot of introspective thinking. Thank you all for coming. I'm so sorry about the wind. Boy, it got pretty fierce out here. <laughs> um, but it was great to introduce you uh, to the battlefield here. And again, we hope that you'll have some interactions with Jill and I in the classroom. We do something called public history. It's a minor here. It's a true distinctive program. There aren't many others like it in the country for undergrads. It's where we train young people to go forth and to talk to the public about a range of what I would consider to be very important historical issues that of course have a, a real connection to uh, contemporary issues as well. Right? So public history, it's something you all should maybe think about. Jill and I, we'd be more than happy to sit down and talk to you about it. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you so it's really much. good to be out here with you. Yeah, absolutely.